Okay, hi, I'm Robert Verding. Um, I come from Alang Solutions, the company. We do training, consulting, and support in and around our languages on the Alang ecosystem. So I'll just try and explain a little bit about what this is and um, how, how it came about. Uh, try and explain why it looks like it does. So yeah, um, I originally worked for Ericsson. Okay, this is a long, 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 long time ago. And um, they had a computer science lab where I worked. And they also have, well, I suppose they still have, well, they had a switch called the AXC, which was a very successful switch. But it required a lot of effort to develop and maintain it. And one of the things we were supposed to look at in the lab was how we could make programming of these type of applications easier, more efficient, but still keeping the same characteristics. And so, what was, the, what is, still is the problem domain? What was the problem domain we were looking at, the type of problem we were trying to solve? Right? So these 12 points, they come from a, um, 10 points, they come from a uh, thesis written by my boss then, Bjarne Decker, of, of, the, of the problem domain for these type of applications. And if you look there, for example, there are different um, levels of interest, you might say. So the most interesting points, the ones marked in red here, are quite general. And if you look at all the points there, for example, there's absolutely nothing about telecoms in that list of the problem domain. The telecoms bit was easy. Making the switch do something, just send it a few, few commands and you set up a connection between two users, that was easy. Right? Or making the telephones ring, that wasn't the problem. Um, we did a lot of experiments in the lab about that. We had our own small exchange and we had hacked that so we could connect it and, and control it from our VAX, which we're running. We had the first Unix machine in, on, in Ericsson. And we could control that and we basically programmed telecoms applications in every language, every system we could run on our machine. I think it must have about 30 or 40 different versions of this. And again, the telecoms was not the difficult thing. This is the di most difficult bit. And some of the points here are, are very um, general. So yeah, we have a large number of concurrent activities. We were thinking in those days of switches, maybe hundreds of thousands of connections to them, maybe tens of thousands of calls going on. So there's a lot of stuff going on at the same time concurrently. You have timing constraints. Things must occur at certain times or take or within, uh, be completed within a certain time. You have distribution. So if you get further down, we have the last one, we have fault tolerance. So the system must be able to survive errors, both in the hardware and the software. And to do that properly, safely, you need a distributed system. You need at least two computers if you want to make a fault tolerance system. So therefore you need support for distribution. Um, a telephone switch should never go down. That's the whole idea, one of the basic um, fundamental requirements of it. So you need to do an operation over many years, and you also need to maintain it and do software maintenance on the system while it's running. You cannot take the system down to do that type of thing. And again, the fault tolerance for hardware errors. So the, these are some the, these were some of the pro these was the, the problem domain, the type of problem we were looking at. Right? And the interesting thing here is that this is not just telecoms. As I said, there's nothing specifically telecom in here. This is, these are very general problems. And especially the red ones I marked out are very common in many systems that have these requirements. So this is the type of problem we were trying to solve. So we realized that the telecoms bit was not the easy bit. This is the difficult bit. How do I do this? So a few reflections on this um, before we go on here. We were not out to implement a functional language. This might be the wrong place to say that, but we weren't out to implement a functional language. We became functional as, as our development of the Alang language and the system around it evolved. We became functional. We found this was the, be the best way to go. Actually, we started off in Prolog, which is very different. So we migrated. We were not out to implement the actor model. So we, we, we read later that Alang implemented the actor model and we went out and read the act, found papers on the actor model and said, yes, it does implement the actor model. Um, we had not heard of the actor model when we were doing this type of stuff. 
So we arrived at this thing as the best way of solving the problem. We were trying to solve the problem. That's what it's all about. That was the whole thing. That was our whole goal. The whole system. A few other reflections as well here. Um, having this way, making it out to solve the problem, that made the development of the language and the system very focused. Because we knew what we were trying to do. Our goal was not to do it in a specific way, but to, do, to make it work. And that meant we had a very clear set of criteria of what should go into the language and what should go into the system. Okay. So was it useful? If we came up with a fantastic new feature, was it actually useful to solving the problem or not? And did it or did it not help build the system? And we came up with a number of ideas we thought were fantastic, but they just weren't useful, so they went. Right? Or they were just bad, bad suggestions for it. We came up with a number of bad ideas as well, too. But um, the language and the system evolved to solve the problem. So we were, de we were developing the language and the way of working, using it to build systems at the same time. Okay. So, so we had this idea of what we knew what the system, the type of problems the system should have, and how, how we should try and solve this, and we would develop the language and the way of using features of the language at the same time. So sort of working upwards and downwards uh, at the same time for it. That's why when you look at the language, you'll, you'll find some things are extremely easy to do because that's what it's designed to do. Like in a functional language, calling a function is easy, easy, right? Because that's what it's supposed to do. Here, doing a lot of these things is easy because that's what it's supposed to do. So the system, the outline of the system design, was designed to solve this type of problem. And in the language and in OTP, which I'll explain later what this, what this is, there's direct support for doing these type of things. So this is how it evolved. And as we kept on working, our ideas about solving the, solving the problem, how do you do this, they evolved as the language and our, as our system ideas evolved at the same time. So where we finally ended up, as I might say, a set of first principles for it, um, was, well, we need a lightweight concurrency. There are a lot of things going on in the system at the same time. We have to be able to handle these, these, all these things very, very efficiently at the same time. So we based it on processes, our concept of processes. We must have a large number of processes in the system. So in those days, we're thinking around hundreds of thousands. Now you've, there are Erlang systems running, running millions of processes in one system. So that we, we have this large, um, this need for large number of large number of concurrency. It must be lightweight. It must be fast to create process. It must be fast to do context switching. In, intercommunication must be fast because everything's based around the processes. Um, we need asynchronous communication. So one of the problems from the timing constraints is the system must never block. And as soon as you start doing synchronous stuff, you block. So we have to make certain we never block. So you need asynchronous communication as a base. We need process isolation because things are going to go wrong, therefore process must be able to die. Um, we need the basis for handling errors. Again, this gets back to the fact that we assume that we, you're going to get errors, so therefore you must be able to handle errors while the system is running. So you must need provisions for that. And you also need support for continuous evolution of the system. Okay. The problem is not loading in code to a running system. The problem is loading in code to a running system while it's actually doing things. There are many systems today where you can have a shell or something that's loaded in and keep going or start again or whatever, but we had to be able to make sure we do this while the system is actually running. No stop. We had a few more things we arrived at. Okay, we need a high-level language to get um, get real benefits. We were compare we were comparing the things with C, Pascal, Ada, other languages as well. So we were finding we need a higher language, high-level language to do it. The language should be simple. The language in the system, the way the system works, should be simple. And what I mean by simple in this case is there should be a small number of basic principles everything's built on. Um, that's not easy. That's difficult to, to work these things out. It's easy to just throw in new, idea, new, new things all the whole time and make the system much more complex, but 
to make this work, you need the basic system should be very simple, and the very ideas it's formed on should be very simple. Um, if you get it right, then you have a powerful language and a powerful system. Because then you can build whatever you need on top of that. You can build all the functionality, functionality you need on top of that and don't have to bake it in and throw it in and make it difficult. So in this sense, small is good. And the language should be simple to understand and program. I don't know if we succeeded in the last bit, but you can't yet. And one other thing we found out, we should provide tools for building systems, not solutions. Because one of the things we noticed when we were, de when we were developing um, the Erlang language and system, so we had a user group who came back and um, we were working together with, and we found that often when we tried to provide a solution for them to try and help them solve their problem, uh, we got it wrong just misunderstood the problem so that we found the basic idea was provide tools for, for them to build systems, to let the users build systems, because they know exactly what they want much better than we could design for them. But we could provide the right set of tools for them to, be, to build what they were trying to do. Yeah. This is actually me at work. Sorry. It, it doesn't look it, but it is. Um, so what am I doing? Well, playing with a train set. Okay. Uh, if you look at the back here, this thing there, that's actually a small switch. That's the switch we had in our lab which we're testing for. So everything we were doing, we're running against that switch and testing it actually worked, right? So we could make telephone calls on that. And we were going to have a trade show. We were going to take part in a trade show. And we thought, well, presenting that box like that's pretty uninteresting. At most, there's, there's no blinking lights on or anything like this. Most of it's small red light saying it's running. So we decided, how could we attract people? So we decided we would make a train set. We'd have a train track running and have a tra trains running on it, powered by Erlang, of course, right? So that's me trying to sit down there and program a system. I probably went slightly overboard in the end because we had a complete ATC system for it, so you could run trains, you make sure they never collide and things like this for you. You could book train paths from one point to another in conjunction with others and the train would move and all these things for it. It was a lot of fun. But it was all written in Erlang, it all worked, and it was fault tolerant. If something went wrong, everything just stopped, right? So there were no collisions or anything like that. So yes, we're doing that. So, so where did we end up? So now we're going to look a bit more about, about uh, where we got to and how this gets back on to what I was talking about, the ecosystem. So yeah, so what we found, what we end up with, with the Erlang language, the sequential language, it's a simple functional language. If you look at it, there's nothing really complex about it. It has a slightly different syntax. Um, most functional languages have a different syntax. Just pick one that just looks different from everything else. It's safe. Now we're comparing to low-level languages here, for example, the no pointers and no pointer errors and things like this. It's reasonably high level. Um, it was then, and it still is in many ways. It's dynamically typed. Okay, the whole system is dynamically typed. Um, and there are no user-defined data types. You have a fixed set of data types you have to use, that's it. Um, I can discuss, talk later if we have time, or if you ask me afterwards why, but there was a specific reason for doing this. It has also a bunch of typical features of functional languages. It, all data is immutable. We have immutable variables. They aren't really variables in that sense. Uh, we extend the use of pattern matching for every, everything. And um, there's no built-in loops or anything like this, at recursion rule. Again, this is just very common to functional languages. There's nothing special about this. So the sequential language is quite straightforward in that sense. I do want, I, I'm not going to show examples of it, but I just want to make mention one feature I think is fantastic. Um, binaries. We have a data type called a binary. It's an array of bytes, which is completely uninteresting, except the interface can be very, is very nice, right? So I can interface this not just as bytes, I can interface it as bit fields, um, integers, floats, and things like this for it. And I can write down a structure as a pattern, which I can then use both to build it and to, to, um, to match against. So this binary, which is a valid Erlang, Erlang syntax, this describes an IP datagram, IP version 4 datagram in one go. So there's a 4-bit version, there's a 4-bit header length, there's an 8-bit service type, a 16-bit total length, 16-bit ID, three flag bits, which I've only seen to be zero, but tell me if I'm wrong here. There's a 13-bit fragment offset, 8-bit time to live, 
8-bit proto, there's a header checksum of 16 bits. We've got service source IP and destination IP of 32 bits. And then you've got the rest, which is a packet. And this binary description describes that packet as in one go. And I can use that both to build a packet. If I use on the right-hand side, I have this construct that will build the packet for me. I just, just give the values of the fields and it'll just build that packet for me. But I can also use it as in a pattern to match against a packet. I can get a packet in and I can pull the whole thing apart in one go by using, by using this match pattern. So it's taking, pat it's taking pattern matching to another level. I don't know if other languages have got this far doing it. It's a shame if they haven't, because they should. But so, yeah, this just shows another thing. We were actually very actively using this Erlang to talk with other things, other parts of the system, using this to communicate with. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So that's the, that was the sequential bit. The concurrency, the concurrency, we found the concurrency to be fundamental. For our type of problem, the concurrency was so fundamental, this is not something you put in a library on top, this is something you bake into the basic system. So there's basic support for concurrency in the language itself and in the, in, in, in the virtual machine, the implemented language. And as Mike Williams, one of, one of, the, one of the, the other um, co-developers of the language, he said, there are three basic properties you need to make for building really concurrent systems. And you need to be able to create processes quickly. You need to be able to do very fast context switches because things are going to be happening all the time between it. And the time to send messages between processes must be very short. If you want to make a truly concurrent system, you have to, you have to um, be able to do this quickly. This is the, the performance is dominated by these point types. That's why we put a lot of effort into this. That's why, for example, we don't use operating system processes or operating system threads because they're just too heavy for what we're doing. It's just not an option. Um, the concurrency model, apart from that, is very simple. Again, it's, it's a simple thing. It's, the key scheme is simple here. It's based on lightweight processes. And they are truly lightweight. You can have millions of processes running in your system. There are products doing that. Um, it's all based on asynchronous message passing. That's the only way of communicating between processes. It's asynchronous message passing. It's, you need to have this for non-blocking. The system must never block. Things should never block. The only way to really guarantee that is by keeping everything asynchronous, or as much as possible asynchronous. As soon as you do something asynchronous, it will block. Um, it's, it's a very basic mechanism. It's very cheap. If you need more complex mechanisms, you build that on top of the asynchronous communication. Uh, we have a selective receive that allows us to, to choose which messages we want to look at, at at a certain point in time. And other messages will just be ignored that have been sent to the process, which means we don't have to, we don't we avoid a combinatorial explosion for having to handle every message every time. Processes are isolated, so they can quite happily crash without taking down other processes. And there is no global data in the system at all times. We only have local data for it. Again, it's all about the concurrency and the fault tolerance for it and the scalability of it. So that is the basic fundamentals of the, of, the, um, of the concurrency model. And it actually isn't more complex than that when you look at it. It might be more complex to use because it's a completely different way of thinking, but it's the, the basic premise is that it's not. And it's the same thing with the, er the error handling. The basic premise behind the error handling is that errors will always occur. You will always get errors in your system. You can, tr you can try as hard as you can to make it error free, but you'll always get errors. It might be software errors, it might be hardware errors, someone sends you the wrong type of data or whatever it might be, you will get errors in your system. Um, so the goal from that is to make sure that the system must never go down. Okay. That is the basic goal of the whole thing of the error handling. The system must never go down. Parts of it may crash and burn. They will, but the system as a whole must never go down. So again, in, in conjunction with, with a telephone switch, yes, you might lose a call occasionally, but the switch itself will never crash. So when things go wrong, the system must survive. Um, that means robust systems must always be aware of errors. So you must always think there are errors, things are going to go wrong, what am I going to do about it? But I do want to avoid writing error checking code everywhere. One, that's very verbose, it's a lot of effort, and it's also very easy to get it wrong. Right? If I have to go try, try and check errors everywhere and work out everything that could happen, whatever like that. 
And we want to be able to handle processes crashing, because they will crash. And we want a mechanism that interacts well with the process communication. So what we want to do, we just want to let things crash. So when a process goes wrong in the system, we want to let it crash and let the system clean up afterwards and keep on going. And crashing one process will not take down the system. So the error handling mechanism, again, is, is very simple. It's process-based. So we, we happily crash processes. I'm talking Allen processes now. Um, we link together processes. And when something goes wrong, a process crash will send an exit signal to that the process is linked to, and they will crash. We'll take them all down. So we can take down a group of processes working together. They just crash the whole thing. You can, however, you need to monitor processes. So there's a way in the system where we call trapping exits so that you can monitor and make sure that when, when it gets an exit signal, it's converted to a message and it can see that the other process has died and do things and clean up about it. So that is the basic fundamentals of the error handling mechanism. So it works very well together with the, with the concurrency process. So they, they sort of fit together nicely. You can, but you can say that this, 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 this way of handling concurrency and the error handling, they're sort of two sides of the, of the Erlang, error, of the Erlang um, concurrency model. They fit together and they work together. There's a lot about error handling here because it was very fundamental. So how do, how do you use this to build robust systems? How do you build robust systems? So we're not saying fault-free systems, we're talking robust systems, things that can survive errors. Um, and at least you need to ensure that there is some fun necessary functionality is always available. There will be parts of the some system of some parts of the system which always have to be available for the system to be running. And so even if you get errors there, that, that still has to, be, has to survive that. And the system has to be able to clean up when things go wrong. So yes, we might crash processes, but we might have to clean up after that process so the system keeps working. And it, well, to be really strict, you need at least two machines. So we need some form of fundamental distribution in this. So, um, Looking at the nece keeping necessary functionality, we use, mes we use something we call supervision trees. Um, we build trees of processes, supervise of processes that manage their children, and, all the, um, and they monitor and manage their children. And if a child dies, child process dies, then the supervisor knows what to do, how to restart it, if it's to be restarted. And you can build supervision trees for it. And supervisors can supervise other supervisors, and etc. And using this mechanism, you can build functionality that will always need to be there. So if something in a supervision tree, which say is a some form of server, server or service uh, crashes, then the super, its supervisor will know how to restart it and keep on going. So it'll still be there. Everything won't be in here because some things we can just let crash. But we also need to be able to monitor clients. Client pro servers need to be able to monitor clients. Processes we're working together need to monitor each other. And groups of processes, might, co-workers might, might die to, together. So if one crashes, the others shut down. And we can use the error handling primitive to do that. We can use the error handling primitive. We do use the error handling primitive to build the supervision trees to make fault tolerant systems. We do that to clean up and to monitor what's going on. And so the mechanisms we came at are extremely simple, but they are the right base for building this on top of it. It's the same with the concurrency model. It is very simple but it's, 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 it's a suitable base for building any form of concurrency on top of one. Yeah, so this gets us to the OTP bit here. OTP stands for Open Telecom Platform. So what is it? It's a set of design patterns for building concurrent fault tolerance systems. So th this is a, how do I use these primitives I have in the language to build this type of system? For example, we had the example with the supervision trees. That's also supported, for example, in OTP. How do I use this? So it's a set of design patterns. It's a set of what we call behaviors that, it for implement, that implement the design patterns and allow you to plug in your specifics into that. And um, the behavior is extensible. So there, there, come, there come five default behaviors with a system, but there's nothing stopping you extending that by putting in new behaviors depending on what you want the system to do. And systems will do that. It's a set of libraries. Well, you need, of course, for programming, quite a large set of libraries. And it's also a set of support tools for building systems and also building releases of systems. As well. This is what OTP is in there. And it, it, its basic design patterns are the type of things we were thinking of 
when we were designing the language and looking at the type of system you would have using the language. So the, lang so the language and the, and the systems fit together. OTP is a way of implementing that type of system. So the, the, the whole thing fits together. So. Which, if you look, makes some things extremely simple to do. Um, the important thing to realize, there's absolutely nothing about telecoms in OTP. If you look inside OTP, you will not find anything telecom specific. I think the closest is an ASN.1 compiler. That's about it, right? So it's nothing about that. So it's all about building this type of system. How do I, how do I build large-scale, concurrent, fault-tolerant, scalable systems? I can just point here, the, the, the type of system you build with Erlang, they tend to be very operating system-like. So you will have a large number of processes coexisting, working together. Um, it provides a set of, providing a set of services, then you things, things using the service. And there is very seldom a central thread of execution. It's not like you're running one thread of execution, maybe starting a few things in parallel. You've got all these processes running concurrently, doing stuff together, working together. That's very much how the system looks. At most, if you want a central thread, there's something which starts this stuff running. Then it all just runs. Anything, there might be lots of little threads running. Every time you need a concurrent activity, for example, you will start a process to do that. And it will manage that, and then when it's done, it will die. And you just keep on doing this the whole time. So there's no central thread at all in the system for it. It's just a different way of thinking. Um, I like to say it's less, it, our language's not so much a language with concurrency, but a system with a language. You're building systems the whole time. So now we've gone to the top level, now, now we'll just go down to the bottom. So what is the beam? And yeah, we're almost done there now. And it's a virtual machine to run Alec, okay, which says very little and says, says very much. Right, that, that's, that's all it is, it's, that's what it's designed to do. And so because of that, a lot of the properties of the system of the language, of course, are built into the beam. So it has support for the lightweight massive concurrency. It's the one that handles all the processes for you, right? sets up processes. It's the one that does the asynchronous communication. It has the process isolation. It has the prim primitives for doing the error handling. All this is baked into the machine. Um, it has support for the continuous evolution of systems, for, for doing dynamic code handling. It has support for the soft real time. Um, it didn't now, but now it has a transparent multi-core support. So it will happily, when you start up an hour it will happily use all the cores on your system. It will dynamically load balance between all the systems and things like that, between all the cores and so on for you automatically. And it has a lot of interfaces to the outside world, interface mechanisms to the outside world. Um, from a language design point of view, you seldom see these things in the language. If you see these things from our language, there's something, to, there's a function to create a process, there's some way of sending messages and receiving messages. That's about it. Right? So it's, everything's under there for you. This is what it's designed to do. It has a few other features. This is more like on the functional side of it, things, what we see. It's the one that supports the immutable data. This immutable data is all the way down, in, baked into the base of the machine. If you try and mutate data, I, don't, I honestly don't know what will happen. It will not work properly anyway that much. It's the one that only has a predefined set of data types. It supports pattern matching, built-in support for pattern matching. It has support for the functional language side for it. Um, it has a specific model of handling code, way of working with that, and it's the one that doesn't have global data. So all these features of the language, they're built into the basic support, basic into, the, into the basic being the virtual machine. This is nothing strange. I mean, that's generally what any virtual machine does. It's designed to, to run a specific something, right? I mean, the JVM is designed to run Java. The Veeam is designed to run Erlang, and has support for all these things for it. And as I said before, the reason it has support, for example, for concurrency the error, and the error handling is because we've considered these to be so fundamental to our, to our problem that we baked um, the primitives of that in the, at the very lowest level. This is not a library. So now we've looked at everything. We've gone from the very top OTP. We looked at Erlang, some principles of it. We've looked at the beam load to support that. And so now we end up at the, at what, 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 what the ecosystem, what this is all about. So what is what we call the Erlang ecosystem? Well, it's a set of languages running on top of the, of the beam of Erlang and OTP. That's what it is. Right? Um, so there's not just one language, there's not just Erlang, there's a set of other languages that, that use this. And then again, this, this, if someone decides to implement new languages for it, it can be extended as well. So 
it's not limited to. Um, the thing with this is that these languages, if they follow the rules, they can easily and openly interact and support other languages in the ecosystem. Which means the system as a whole will become much more powerful than any language on it. Because you can use these things. You can interchange them, you can mix them and so on. This is what the ecosystem is. It also means, for example, that you will never make a wrong choice of the language because it will work together with everything else running on the ecosystem. Because you can, mix, you can write your system mixing the languages for them because they interact with each other. There's just no problem. There's no co problem calling functions from one language from another language because it's just well-defined how to do that. It makes the whole system much more powerful. It provides a lot of features in all the languages then to get it. For example, um, there are primitives in the Beam and in the OTP for communicating with other languages. There are a number of different ways of doing it. And one example here is we can talk, for example, with the JVM. And because the ecosystem can, any language running on it can as well. So we can interact with the JVM, we can send work to it, we can ask it to do things. We have a slightly special back door here. Um, it's our Jank. So on the JVM, there is actually an Erlang system running, or implement on it. And it's a very full one, complete one. It's just slightly lacking to become actual product, which is a shame. But it is very good, which means you can run distributed Erlang. You can run, run one Erlang node on the JVM, another running on the Erlang system. They can communicate with each other and work together if you want to do that, which means it's quite simple. So I just want to wind up with talking a little bit about extending the system. So new skins for the old ceremony. That, by the way, is a very good CD. If nothing else comes out, listen to that music. It's a bit old now, but it's very good. Um, it's like all Leonard Cohen music, music, very depressing, but it's very good. So yeah, new skins. We want, we, we want to extend the system. So we'll look at a couple of different cases here. So um, we can have languages that still keep the basic Erlang execution model and data type, but maybe give you a new syntax and a different packaging for it. And two examples of that are Elixir and LFE, which is this flavored Erlang, which is missing a parenthesis. Um, <laughs> yes, I know, it's a show. <laughs> and both of those work at the base level. So, so um, yeah. But you can add other languages as well, too. Two others, there's actually a Lua running on top of the Erlang system as well, which interacts with the, with the others, and a Prolog as well. And how they work is that you have the basic system, you have the virtual machine at the bottom, you have Erlang, you have OTP, the whole set of libraries for it, and you can take your new language and you can put that on top of it. So you can add your new language on top and use all the features in there. You can add your new libraries and you can interact with the existing libraries. For it. Doing this way, you can put a new skin on it, which can look and feel very different, but it's, at the base level, it's not. Right. And um, the thickness of the skin will sort of tell you how, much, how well you interact with the system, with the other things on it. So uh, uh, one example, of course, is Elixir, which is relatively new, but becoming very popular. And from its own quote, it's a dynamic functional language designed for building scalable and maintainable applications. Yes, that is what the whole ecosystem is all about. So you're on, on to that. Um, it's influenced by Ruby, but it's not Ruby. So it, it looks Ruby-ish, but it's definitely not Ruby. It has metaprogramming capabilities using macros, which is a nice thing for it. And it has many libraries and interfaces. Um, they've been standardized, rewritten, extended with new features as well. For example, they're using the OTP behavior functionality by adding new behaviors to the system, which is nothing strange, because that's what, what OTP allows you to do. It also comes with an extensive set of build tools. So this is one, lang this is one language. And this is, I'd say, it's quite thin skin, because when you get down to it, the base, it's still the, it's still the same execution uh, memory model as, as um, Erlang has for it, so it's quite thin skin for it, which means the interaction with Erlang is very tight. Another one, of course, is LFE, this flavored Erlang. That's for us who like parentheses. Um, it's a Lisp syntax front end. Well, it's more these days. It's actually a real Lisp with all the features you would assume to have in a Lisp. So it's it's um, all the Lisp goodies. It's a truly homo iconic language with real macros, macros as God intended them to be. It seamlessly interacts with the rest of OTP, Erlang and OTP, and it has a small, very small core language. So again, I would class this as thin skin. Um, an example of another language on top is Lua. 
So we're running, there's a Lua implementation running on top of the, uh, of, um, the running in the ecosystem. So again, a quote from Lua, it's a powerful, efficient, lightweight, embeddable scripting language. It supports procedural programming, object-oriented programming, functional programming, data-driven programming, and data description. Basically everything. Um, one thing I like about Lua, it's a very small language. They've kept this simple. They've managed to keep it simple. It's using the right primitives. It's simple, and you can actually do all these things on top of this by using the primitives in the right way. So philosophically, I very much like it. Um, we implement all of 5.2. For example, we implement shared mutable global data which is things that the, the virtual, that the Beam OTP is not supposed to do, right? So we implement that on top of this. And we implement Lua's handling of code, which again is different from the handling of code in, uh, in the ecosystem. So that means, and a few other things as well that just don't fit very well for us. And that means we actually, this is quite, this is quite a thick skin, really, on top of this. But it does, and it works on top of it, and, and it can interact with everything else for us. So if anyone's in, in, interested, I can show a system later. We're running small spaceships, and in the logic of the spaceships is programmed in Lua. And um, running on top of the, the Alang system, so each spaceship is an Alang process. Just to show that the interaction does work for us. So, that's okay. so this is quite a thick skin, to be honest, because I have to implement the things on the shared mutable global data. That's, that, that's where the main problem is. It just doesn't exist. I have to implement this on top. But it works. And it's the same, I'm not going to take up the prologue, but it's the same thing with the prologue as well. That also works. That has, a, again, a different me memory model and execution model, which you have to implement on top of that. So it's also relatively thick skin. So this is what the ecosystem's all about. These languages that are running on top of the Alang beam and interacting and coexisting together to provide support for us. Um, and using the, but using the basic features and extending the basic features to interact for us, which gives you different, different feel for what's going on. Um, yeah, that's about it. Okay. So, a any questions? I think, do we, have, we still have a bit of time left? Or? Yeah, we still have some time. So, any questions? Yeah. Okay, the question was, why not use a defined data type? Um, it's basically having to do with, with the dynamic code handling. The code handling is such that at any time in the system, you can, re you can load in any module you want, or redefine or reload in any module you want while the system is running. In that sense, there is no concept of a system, which means that if I were to define a data type, have a user-defined data type, there's no guarantee that I, I don't redefine that in the middle in one module and using the old version of the other module or something like this. For it. it just doesn't work. You might be able to do that, I don't know. You probably know better if you can do that these days, but we could not come up with a way of doing that then, right? Because the very dynamic nature of the system means you cannot have that concept of something which is um, user-defined and global. Yeah. Do they work over a long um, Okay, if you get running thin skinned, you fake it. Okay. So, <laughs> um, so for example, a, a, a classic one is Erlang has something called records, which are just syntactic sugar for running tuples, which are used, which are predefined in the system. Um, Elixir has structs, which is just based on maps, which is one of the predefined data types. That's the only, that's really the only, if you want to run it at the low level, the native level, that's how you do it, you fake it, right? You make something that looks like something else. Um, if you want to run something like in the Lua, well, there you implement a memory model. You implement a system um, which implements the whole memory model. So for, for, for Lua, I had to implement shared global immutable data based on top of that system. That's how, that's how you have to do it. I will start the time. Sure. I've got a question for you about the. Um, oh. I've got a question for you about the uh, dynamic uh, full service upgrade. Yeah. So, Alan has, has this mechanism that lets you upgrade at a very fine level. So, you could run it off yeah. the same day. So here's where we are. But 
if you're running on a cluster with nodes, there's another way to do that though, right? Which is just one by one, take the node down, take one node down, upgrade it, bring it back up. And then just the fact that the cluster as a whole is supposed to work in a fault tolerant way means it should just work. Yeah. Now, I can see all kinds of arguments in principle for why you don't want to conflate <laughs> upgrade with nodes. But in practice, where as Erlang is developed, your experience now, yeah. is that fine grain um, in service upgrade really used? It's used in some cases. But often it is, as you say, if you're running multiple machines, you will take you or multiple nodes, you will take down, generally do a rolling upgrade and take down that. That's the more standard method for it. Um, but as I said, there are some cases where people are actually doing dynamic upgrades of, the, of one node to the system while it's running. But even if you have multiple nodes, you still run into the problem with user data types. Because you can't, if you're doing rolling upgrades, if I change a data type in one node, it's suddenly completely inconsistent with everything else in all the other nodes. You, you still have to do a lot of work to get around it. I, I'm guessing you can get around it, but. Um, yeah, that's not unique to upgrading to a node at a time. That's not unique to. make software upgrade into possible. Yeah. I didn't say it was easy. Uh, it's possible, and I can say there is support for doing it in OTP. There is support for doing that. It's one of the one of the facilities you get for, for handling releases. You can define an upgrade of what's what it's supposed to do when it, when it's upgrading, and, and it will do it for you if you get it right. But yes, most times most people or people using it will do rolling upgrades instead. Yeah, there was another. Um, tele well, depends which company you went to. So, so Ericsson, um, their AXE systems were programmed in a language called Plex, which I, I mean, there's, there's still an, there's still AXE in the bottom somewhere, so I'm still probably still programmed in Plex, uh, which was a very simple language, um, which supported these features. Because I mean, this 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 by the way gave us a very nice target because if if if, if Plex and the AXE could do it, we had to be able to do it at the same time, had to be able to do the same thing, right? Well, the same effect. Um, other systems I know were written in C. There were a lot of languages being written. I'm guessing probably some were written in assembly as well too. What they're written in today, I have absolutely no idea. But um, I'm guess hopefully they've gone higher up, but I have no idea. Wait, we've got one here, then we've got one there. So about the error handling, uh, about the little crash thing. Yeah. Uh, so I read an article a few months ago, I think, where, uh, where the author was suggesting that if there's a precondition that if for your program, a file has to be present, and if you're reading that file, and for some reason that file is not present in Java or other languages, you have a you have a try catch block to yeah. do that. Here, you just let it crash and. Uh, <laughs> it, it's based. It's based on processes. Okay. So. Um, be very careful. W w when I'm saying let it crash, I'm not saying let the system crash. I'm, setting le I'm saying let one small part of the system crash internally. So be very careful. Uh, th there was a d the discussion on, on Stack Overflow a couple of years ago about the Erlang let it crash philosophy. And one guy there was getting extremely worked up because he said, how can you just let your system crash? If my system crash, it costs me a few hundred thousand dollars every time. So how can you do that, right? And what he missed, of course, we're not talking about the system. We're talking small parts of the system, internal parts of the system. And the, the whole, the whole, um, the way to get around this, how, how you handle this, is you design the system in such a way that when something crashes, other parts of the system will know what to do, how to clean up after it, restart things when necessary, clean up after it. So that, that, that's that's what the letter, the letter crash philosophy sounds much worse than it is in that sense. <laughs> As I was saying, the worst thing that can happen is the system go down. We can accept things going wrong internally, might lose things for the system that's around. Um, another perhaps better way of describing it has been called an error kernel. You have a central part of the system which can handle errors everywhere else in a, in a reasonable way. If that, if that answers your question. So yeah, it sounds much worse than it is. 
it, it's a great marketing, but some. Erlang has a property like uh, hot loading code, right? Uh, yeah. When, when it, uh, is it a property of uh, Beam or is it a, I mean, is it a feature of Beam or is it pro uh, a feature of Erlang? If it is a feature of Beam, uh, will that be, I mean, uh, is it possible to use that feature in Lua also? Um, it's a feature of the Beam. It, it, it's a feature of the Beam. Um, or the basic mechanism is implemented in the Beam, then there's a library on top which uses that. More person. Um, the trouble or the issue, problem, trouble, how you want to say it with Lua is Lua has a different way of working with code. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't work the same way as the, as the Alang system provides you. Um, which means if you want to be complete Lua compliant, you have to go past, you have to look past the, the um, Alang code. You have, to do it, you have to do it yourself, basically. So you can't use you can't use the basic me the basic mechanisms in Alang to, to handle Lua code. You have to do it yourself and, and to bypass that system for you. Wait, I've got, okay, I've got one here then. Yeah, no, you have to think about this. You have, when you design the architecture of your system, you have to go through and think, okay, I've, I've this class of processes, if one of these crashes, what do I do? If this crashes, what do I do? You have to structure your system around that. So w once you've done that, then they can crash, because then you've fixed up the system around so it will handle it. But you do have to think, you have to think ahead of what, what can go wrong. Where, well. Not just what, ca not so much what can go wrong, but where where th can things go wrong, and what do I do about it when it happens? And then I can let it, cr then I can let it crash because I know the rest of the system will clean up after. You'll, what? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. We want more. Okay. Thank you again very much. <laughs>